Okay, so again, my name is Nicole Grenan. Our talk today is Shipwrecks of Northwest Florida. I think everyone should be able to see my screen. Some are having trouble hearing me. Um, is anyone else, can you hear me, but is it really low level? Anybody else? Sound fine. Other people are saying it's okay. So it might be a local computer thing. Okay. All right. So maybe just a personal thing that someone's having here. I apologize. Um, I did turn my microphone volume up all the way. So I'm not, I'm not sure that there's too much I can do on this end. Um, all right. So my name is Nicole Grenan. I work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network as an archaeologist. Um, why am I qualified to give this presentation? Because my specialty in archaeology is actually underwater archaeology. Um, I trained as an underwater archaeologist at the University of West Florida here in Pensacola. We have a one of the very unique programs in underwater archaeology. And um, I'm working on a PhD through a university in the UK. I'm doing it via distance learning on Florida shipwrecks and heritage tourism. Um, so shipwrecks are really my thing and uh, especially shipwrecks here in Florida. So that is why I am giving this presentation today and I'm excited to be here. Everyone, can you see my screen? Can I get a thumbs up from somebody? Can you see the presentation screen? All right, perfect. Thank you, appreciate that. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, with every presentation, I have lots of good stories, but I like to preface my stories about shipwrecks with what underwater archaeology is, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what shipwrecks are and what they mean to archaeologists. Let's go all the way back in our presentation. Oh no! Let me just uh, reset here so that we get started at the beginning. All right. All right, what are shipwrecks? Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about what shipwrecks are. When people think about shipwrecks, I think a lot of time they think about things like Spanish gold or they think about pirate treasure. I think a lot of people fixate on the treasure thing, gold, silver, jewels, et cetera, et cetera. And while certainly there have been shipwrecks recorded archeologically or found by other people uh, that have those things or were Spanish colonial shipwrecks or they were pirate shipwrecks, those did exist, it certainly isn't the majority of what archaeologists find. And while finding gold and silver and jewels might be cool and it may make news stories, um, it doesn't tell us a whole lot about people in the past. Um, there are a lot more artifacts out there that can tell us about people's stories. So a lot of people just tend to jump right to pirates and treasure and Spanish gold. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's not really it. Archaeology and underwater archaeology is a lot more than that, and I think a lot cooler than that. So, oh, yes, and another thing, one more thing, people, when they think of shipwrecks, they tend to think of ships just on the bottom of the ocean, as they were when they were sailing, um, maybe with skeletons lashed to the wheel and sails billowing in the current. Um, and that's not really what archaeology and underwater archaeology looks like. Shipwrecks, as when they land on the bottom of the ocean, they start to degrade pretty quickly. Um, so that's not usually what we're finding as archaeologists. It's a lot more interesting than that. So what is a ship exactly? Well, here's a good example, right? This is what a shipwreck actually looks like. This is a steamship that was sunk over in the Seminole River in Alabama. And what you're seeing is the top of the boiler sticking out there above the surface of the water. This is what a shipwreck actually looks like. Oh, I zoom in a little there. Here is another example of what a shipwreck actually looks like. This is a shipwreck in the Florida Keys the wood from this ship is gone, but what you're seeing are the ballast stones, right? So ballast stones or metal or concrete was used in the bottom of the hull of a ship to help it cut through the water better. It weights the ship down, so it makes its way through the water. Um, so while that wood is gone from this shipwreck, we can still see that there was a ship there because of that giant mound of ballast. So that's another thing or another way a shipwreck actually looks. Here's another one. This is a shipwreck on a beach. This is actually over in Orange Beach, Alabama. Um, so just across the border from Pensacola. And this shipwreck uh, was wrecked during a storm. What you're seeing here is actually the very bottom of that ship's hull. 
So the long line of wood running out from the computer screen is the keel or the backbone of the ship. And then the things coming out to the side are the frames or the ribs of a ship. Sometimes it's easy to talk about ships in terms of the human body. Um, so that's what you're seeing there, the very bottom of that ship. Over time, the rest of the ship, the upper works, um, were either torn away or uh, were carried off by other storms. This is also what shipwrecks look like, right? These are two shipwrecks here in Pensacola, Florida at a place called Shields Cove. Um, it's along kind of where the Blackwater River meets Blackwater Bay meets Escambia Bay. And it's a little dent in the side of the bay or the cove um, where about 100, 150 years ago, people would take ships that were no longer useful. They would tow them there and they would leave them there um, because what else were you going to do with them? So in this particular area, Shields Cove, there are about 15 to 17, maybe more unrecorded ships um, that we know of. So what you're seeing here are actually two ships. The one on the right is a cargo vessel. You can tell by the square shape. These would have been used up and down the river to carry things like timber or bricks out to the port of Pensacola. The ship on the left is uh, what we think is a lumber schooner. Um, and this would have been used to carry lumber out from the port of Pensacola to other places in the Gulf of Mexico or across the Atlantic. Um, so very interesting kind of view of different ship shapes here. So I talk, I do a lot of trashing of pirates in the beginning, I suppose, but I do like this one quote uh, from Disney movie, Pirates of the Caribbean. This is Captain Jack Sparrow, for those of you who have seen the movies. Um, and he has a really good quote about what ships are. Um, he says, that's what a ship is. It's not just a keel and a hull and a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. That's its parts. Um, but what a ship is, and he's talking in this case about his ship, the Black Pearl, what a ship is, is freedom. So the reason why I like this quote is, yes, for archaeologists, the stuff is cool. The artifacts are cool. The ship itself is cool. But as an archaeologist, what we're really trying to get at are the stories behind those shipwrecks, right? What does it tell us about people's lives? So that's what we're doing as underwater archaeologists. We're using shipwrecks to find clues about the human past. And shipwrecks have tons of clues about the human past. They can tell us about people's life ways, the way that they live their lives. They can tell us about what goods were traded across the world. They can tell us about how people navigated their way across the world before the invention of GPS and satellite. Shipwrecks can tell us about the colonization of the world and how people moved from coast to coast, from landmass to landmass. Shipwrecks can tell us about warfare, right? How weapons technology changed over time. Shipwrecks can tell us about disease. The plague, right, during the Middle Ages um, was carried on rats on ships from port to port in Europe. And we can actually document the spread of these diseases based on rat remains in shipwrecks from ships of that time period. And they match up pretty significantly to historical records. So really fascinating things. And of course, shipwrecks can tell us about language and culture, right? There's a reason why in North America, Central America, South America, we speak English, Spanish, Portuguese, French as our primary languages, right? Those weren't the languages that were, people were speaking here 1,000 years ago. Those languages came with colonization fleets on ships. So the reason we speak the languages we speak today is because of ships. And all of this is just to say, right, shipwrecks tell us about people. And as archaeologists, that's really what we want to get at. The stuff is cool, but the story about people in the past is even cooler. So why are shipwrecks important archaeologically? Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. Especially here in Florida, artifacts and very old artifacts don't tend to last over time, right? Our soil is very acidic. Our air is humid. The salt air eats away at metals. Mm -hmm. So shipwrecks, when they're buried underwater, if they get buried, right, they can have excellent preservation. Right? Another really cool thing, and in, what you're seeing here is a tray of artifacts, um, and these are all from a shipwreck from about 450 years ago um, here in Pensacola Bay, uh, the Manual Point shipwrecks from the Tristan the Luna fleet. Um, these artifacts are things like tiny rat bones, 
right? You can see there are peach pits, olive pits, um, tiny pieces of ceramics. If you look really close towards the right middle area, there's a, a dice with numbers carved into it. That's actually a bone dice, a die. Um, so these things, no way that these could have survived on land for 450 years. But because this particular shipwreck was buried in sediment, which created an anaerobic or no oxygen environment, so nothing could live in it, that's why these things have survived. The other cool thing about shipwrecks underwater is that people don't live underwater, right? People live on land, obviously, we don't breathe underwater. And when, where people live tends to be the same places over time. Humans like fresh water, we like high ground, and we like a good source of food. People tend to live in the same places. Pensacola is a great example. We have people living in this area for thousands of years, even before the, uh, the Spanish colonials arrived. Native Americans were living in this area. For archaeologists, it can be very difficult to tease out different populations of people when they've been living in an area for thousands or hundreds of years. Underwater, that's not the case. When a ship wrecks, a ship wrecks, right? And everything that's in that ship goes down with it. And it's very rare that two shipwrecks wreck right on top of each other. So shipwrecks are essentially like time capsules. And there's a lot less confusion about where things come from over time. Now, do we find things like Gatorade bottles or beer cans on shipwrecks underwater? Sometimes, yes. But those are very easy to differentiate from the archaeological remains. Um, and here's another rat throw in. Um, this again is from those Emanuel Point shipwrecks from 1559 here in Pensacola Bay. Um, this is a black rat. And this entire skeleton, again, preserved 450 years. And I always like to say this, Pensacola, uh, home of the very first documented black rat in the United States. So another very critical claim to fame for us here in Pensacola. So. Shipwrecks are important archaeologically. They provide us with unique information about our past. The important thing to remember is that shipwrecks are not renewable resources. We can grow often new plants and trees and things like that, but we're never going to grow new Spanish galleons from the colonial period, right? Pensacola is never going to grow new Emanuel Point shipwrecks from the Luna expedition. It's just not going to happen. So it's important that we take care of the sites that we have so that we can get the information from them. Um, of course, that's important to archaeologists because we care about history and information, but it's also important to people as well, right? Citizens who are interested in history. They want to know these things. They want to know where their ancestors came from, what it means to them. So it's important for a lot of people other than just archaeologists. And another great thing about shipwrecks, and especially for coastal communities like we have here in Florida, is that shipwrecks provide opportunities for recreation, right? Divers like to visit these places. They are really fascinating to go and see firsthand. Um, and so they provide a lot of money for our local economies. If we don't protect our shipwrecks, we lose these exciting places to go and dive and to learn more about history in general. So shipwrecks are important archeologically, but they're also important biologically. Anything that lands on the ocean here in Florida, lands in the sand, becomes an artificial reef almost immediately. Right? Life is attracted to whatever lands on the bottom of the water. And the same is true of shipwrecks. Shipwrecks and their ballast piles, if they have one, um, they become artificial reefs. They're shelter for juvenile fish and other creatures underwater. They provide protection. Uh, shipwrecks also act as substrate for invertebrates. Right? These are artificial reefs. Corals start growing off of them and sometimes provide some of the most beautiful places to go and visit. Um, both from an ecological standpoint and from an archaeological standpoint. So shipwrecks are important, not just as archaeological sites, but because they have become a critical part of the underwater environment. Now, problems that affect shipwrecks, I'll go through these pretty quickly. All archaeological sites have problems. Some of those problems are due to human impacts. Uh, people sometimes loot archaeological sites for Artifacts and then they sell them is really what we're talking about here. Souvenir collecting is a little bit more innocent, but still a problem. If everyone removes something from a shipwreck, um, eventually there will be nothing left, right? So we want to make sure that we keep these things intact. Um, inadvertent human impact. Sometimes people use shipwrecks, historic shipwrecks, as uh, fishing grounds, right? But unfortunately, if you drop your anchor through that shipwreck, you're causing some significant damages to those sites. 
erosion uh, from hurricanes and storms can affect shipwrecks, as can development along beaches um, or um, the construction of bridges or dredging projects in ports. All of these things can affect shipwrecks. And so just a couple of photos here. What happens when we disturb shipwrecks? Well, that important context I talked about where everything is buried like a time capsule, it's completely destroyed and then the knowledge is lost. The visual beauty of the site is damaged and the marine ecosystem is uh, often wrecked. Um, so in this photo here, you see, this was actually a 1733 Spanish galleon um, called the Tres Puentes that has actually been picked apart um, since the 1960s. And while the shipwreck was once very beautiful, um, this is what it looks like today. Not very exciting to go and visit. Uh, this is a very uh, pixelated image here. This is supposed to be a broken coral reef system, which was actually broken um, as folks tried to pursue artifacts to collect. And then here's another shipwreck ballast pile that was completely disturbed as someone tried to create a, a casita or a home for lobster there so that they could collect lobster uh, during their next fishing trip. So you can see all of that ballast has moved aside to put in some of these structures. So unfortunate things. Florida's answer to this was to start doing more education and outreach about shipwrecks and to create a program called the Underwater Archaeological Preserves, um, or the Museums in the Sea. And that is a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about three shipwreck sites that are a part of this Underwater Archaeological Preserve program. Um, and these shipwrecks are located in Pensacola, Panama City, and in Port St. Joe. We're going to stretch almost the entirety of the Florida panhandle. The Museums in the Sea program again, was developed as a way to protect and preserve these resources, but also to educate the public about their importance and get people to go and visit them too, because a lot of times when you see something firsthand, you care about it a little more. Um, and so there's a great poster um, for the Museums in the Sea program that we have here at our coordinating center. So if you ever want one, you can get in touch or come visit someday and grab one. Um, but there's also a great companion website too, museumsinthesea.com. And there's information on these 12 shipwrecks throughout Florida um, that you can go and visit. And we're going to just talk about the three in the panhandle today. Um, so here's just what some of the sites look like. All of the sites have a bronze plaque included on them for divers so that they can uh, know which site they are visiting and learn a little bit about its history. Um, here's two of them, one for Copenhagen and Half Moon, which are in um, Peninsular Florida. And here is a photo of the website um, where you can click on each of the shipwrecks and learn more about their history, see some photos of them underwater, and see some video. Again, museumsinthesea.com. And then the interesting thing is that all of these sites have been included on the National Register of Historic Places. So this is a federal program that documents the significance of these historic sites. So these sites are of national significance and as such they are registered. Um, the sites were originally selected by local communities um, working with the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research's underwater team and the local communities have I think in large part claimed ownership of these sites even though they still belong to the people of Florida um, they feel responsibility for them and so we see and encourage local dive companies, charter operations um, to, to kind of put forth the motto of take only photos and leave only bubbles. Because these sites are important to them and they bring them a lot of um, income, we hope. All right, so the important thing to know as I get started here, and I just kind of looked down at a comment uh, in the chat screen um, about the Oriskany versus Massachusetts, the three shipwrecks I chose are because they are of historic significance um, and they are part of the Museums in the Sea program. Um, they all have fantastic stories, but I didn't exclude other shipwrecks or I didn't include other shipwrecks, mostly because of time constraints. Um, there are so many good stories that I could tell about shipwrecks in Florida um, and specifically in Northwest Florida. Um, so I just chose these as kind of a sampling of some of the things. The Oriskany, um, is of historic value. It was sunk as an artificial reef um, intentionally. Massachusetts 
was sunk intentionally, as we'll see, um, but it wasn't intended to be an artificial reef. That's not why it was sunk. So I hope that answers that question. We can come back to it a little bit later. So let's go ahead and jumpstart with USS Massachusetts. Um, there are other vessels called the USS Massachusetts, um, but this one is BB-8. Um, it's the oldest existing American battleship. And let's see here. It was one of three Indiana-class battleships authorized in 1890 as part of the New Steel Navy, so a reinvention of the American Navy. Um, this Massachusetts is BB-2. Um, so let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. This met the USS Massachusetts, the one that sunk here, is about 350 feet long when she was officially commissioned by the Navy. Um, she had a beam or a width of 69 feet and a draft of 24 feet. So she was a big vessel. Um, she saw her first battle during the Spanish American War. Um, she sailed to Cuba during this war to help blockade ports there. Um, the ports were Cienfuegos and Santiago. Um, so she saw action in the Spanish-American War. Um, after the war, and in 1906, she was decommissioned. Um, but in 1910, um, they kind of revived her a little bit. They refitted her and so with some new hardware and some telegraphs. Um, and she served as a, a practice ship, essentially, for um, new recruits in the Navy. And she also, ah, toward the end of her life, served as a gunnery practice ship for naval reserve crews after uh, war was eventually declared on Germany in the 1940s. Oh, wait, no, let me go back here. I've got different, no, okay. So gunnery practice ship, we're not going 1940 yet. So let's, let's stick with early, early years here. So, USS Massachusetts, she was eventually decommissioned in 1919. She returned to Philadelphia. She was decommissioned for the final time. So we're not talking about World War II yet. That's going to be in another presentation or another um, shipwreck. She was completely stripped of her guns and her furnishings. Um, so all of kind of the, the fancy equipment, the upper works were taken off. And she was towed to Pensacola in 1921, um, essentially to be used as target practice. Um, and there's some interesting articles from the period um, in Pensacola. Um, the military at the time, and na Naval Air Station Pensacola, um, they were inventing a system of guns um, that could defend the coast of the United States. Um, and the idea, and this was after World War I, the idea of these, this kind of moving gun system was to be able to load massive guns onto essentially railroad tracks and move them up and down the coast of the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic coast of the US so that you could have um, artillery anywhere you needed it to go, essentially. And there are some really interesting articles of the Navy um, testing these new systems of defense um, and actually <coughs> lobbying, right, shot over the city of Pensacola and windows were being blown out as things flew overhead of people's homes. And what they were shooting at was the USS Massachusetts. So some really interesting stories with that. Um, so she was used for target practice, and that's how she eventually landed where she did. Um, in January 1921, she was used as that target practice for this experimental artillery. And then she eventually sank just outside the entrance to Pensacola Pass. Let's see, go ahead and mute everybody here. All right, so here's a good historical photograph of USS Massachusetts um, going to her final resting place. Um, now, the remains of the USS Massachusetts are sometimes still visible above the surface. A lot of the upper works um, were removed, but at very low tide, um, and sometimes not even very low tide, you can actually still see the gun turrets for USS Massachusetts sticking out of the water near Pensacola Pass. And that's what you're seeing in these photos here, the two large gun turrets kind of sticking out. Now, is this a hazard to navigation? Yes. Is it marked on charts? Yes. Does that stop people who are having a good time and maybe not paying attention from running into them? No. Um, and so we often get folks who are on their boat uh, who ground themselves on USS Massachusetts gun turrets. Um, she really is only in about 30 to 35 feet of water. 
Um, so pretty shallow, probably not the best place to have sunk her, um, but she's been there forever now and has served as a local fishing and diving spot for many, many years. Um, the title, and kind of an unusual move, the title of USS Massachusetts is actually awarded to the state of Florida in 1956. Um, it's not very often that the U.S. military um, awards title to their craft to the state, um, but they did in the case of USS Massachusetts. Um, in 1993, Massachusetts became Florida's fourth underwater archaeological preserve. Then it was located or nominated by the local Pensacola community. And I see that there are some lines on my screen there. Those are actually drawn by someone who's in our chat room. Um, so if whoever drew those could take those off, I'd appreciate it. Um, just so we, everyone else can see the presentation. All right, so here is a schematic drawing of USS Massachusetts that was collected by the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research. Um, this was before she was sunk. And then this is what she looked like after sinking, or essentially what she looks like today. Now, of course, there's a lot of sand that moves in and out with storms and such. Um, so she doesn't always look quite as uncovered as this, but it's a fantastic dive site. There's always a ton of life on the site. We've seen things like manta rays and Goliath grouper on USS Massachusetts. Um, she has wooden decking, or she was built with wooden decking. You can still see some of that. Um, Here's just some photos. The water around Massachusetts can either be very, very clear or very, very murky. So it's kind of just a day-to-day -day thing. Um, I see, why did this ship sink? The ship sank because it was used as target practice by the military. Um, so it was the Navy that actually sunk her where they did. So here's some divers on Massachusetts. You can see just how massive she is. This is the, her side right here. Um, you can see some of the machinery here from Massachusetts. Here's a person popping out of one of the holes in the deck on Massachusetts. Um, and one of the interesting thing is there was a local man um, named Charles who was actually in 1992 when Massachusetts was in the process of becoming a Florida underwater archaeological preserve. Um, he was actually still around and he provided um, archaeologists at the state a lot of information about the ship. Um, and that was critical for doing a lot of the initial research to compile Massachusetts history. Unfortunately, he did pass away before it was officially sanctioned as an underwater archaeological preserve, but um, that legacy still lives on today. And one of the really unique things about USS Massachusetts was this winged victory sculpture. Um, that sculpture is no longer located on Massachusetts. It was actually removed and sent to a museum um, I believe back in Massachusetts, but I'd have to double check on that. The sculpture was removed. It's not on the site today, so you can't see it when you dive it, unfortunately. But it's one of the really unique um, pieces or parts of USS Massachusetts. And it was aimed, um, determined to be special enough to preserve rather than the entire ship itself. All right, so USS Massachusetts. Moving on, we're moving east. Um, and we're gonna talk about the tarpon now the SS Tarpon, Steamship Tarpon. So here is a great um, a painting of Tarpon. You can see it along a dock with a little steamship coming in. Tarpon has a fantastic story. She was a twin screwed uh, freight and passenger steamer and she was constructed in 1887 um, as Naugatuck. That was her original name. Um, she was 130 feet in length 26 foot in beam or width, and with an eight foot depth of her hold. So she was eight feet deep. Um, she was powered, like I said, by twin fore and aft steam engines with propellers, twin propellers. Two years after she was built, the owners of Nagatuck sold her to Henry Plant, who you may recognize the name if you are a native to Florida. Um, he had a railroad empire that terminated in Tampa. Um, and it was actually one of the largest conglomerates in the United States. Um, he was sold, or she was sold to Henry Plant. In 1891, she was sent back and she was actually lengthened um, by about 30 feet and renamed Tarpon. Um, and she came back to Florida. And we think that she was potentially used as some of the vessels um, that Henry Plant supplied to the war effort during the Spanish-American War to transport troops and supplies from Cuba. 
1902, after that, she was eventually sold to the Pensacola St. Andrews and Gulf Steamship Company and was put in charge um, of a captain named Willis Barrow. And he and the Tarpon would become best of friends over their career together. Um, Captain Barrow and Tarpon were essentially famous along the northern Gulf Coast during the early 1900s. They would make weekly runs between Mobile, Pensacola, St. Andrew Bay, which is around Panama City area, uh, Apalachicola, and Carabelle, so all up and down the panhandle. Um, and what he would do is he would carry um, supplies or people, so it was passenger and cargo vessel. And this was a time before there were a lot of the bridges and roads and highways that we use to get around to all of these places today. So people relied on these coasting steamships or schooners um, to get around, to send mail, to go visit relatives. So this was an important route. And he did this for over about 30 years, actually it was about 30 years, um, and he completed 1,500 of these voyages in this career um, with Tarpon. And it's estimated that the steamer traveled about a distance of 700 miles during its career. And uh, that's equal to about 28 times around planet Earth, if that gives you a little bit of an estimate of what that was like. Um, so, a massive career. One of the interesting things, oh, there we go. One of the interesting things uh, about Captain Barrow, um, he loved his vessel, the Tarpon. Um, they were so regular on their journey that one of his famous quotes was, God makes the weather and I make the trip, right? So he always made his trip just as God makes the weather. Um, so she operated like this for over 30 years. Now the story ends, of course, we know that she's a shipwreck. <laughs> the story ends in 1937 um, on September 1st. Um, there were calm seas predicted for that evening, um, but as as Barrow was nearing Panama City area, the wind freshened, right? The wind picked up. Um, there was a leak in the bow that had been increasing over time. It needed to be fixed, um, but they were pumping out the bilges because they knew they had the leak. Unfortunately, the folks who were pumping the bilges just could not keep up with the leak. Um, so the steamer started to take on water and at the end of this kind of journey, they were trying to pull in, trying to get into Panama City as quickly as they could. Um, but unfortunately, when they were less than 10 miles from shore, the tarpon started to sink and Barrow, the captain, eventually gave the order to abandon ship. And at that point, the tarpon had no radio and no distress flares were fired from the ship. So no one who was nearby at St. Andrew's Bay uh, knew that the ship had sunk. Um, Unfortunately, at the time, there were 31 people aboard. There were life jackets giving out. One of the launches, uh, one of the launch boats actually launched, um, but it tipped and capsized. Um, of the people who were lost during the wrecking event um, was um, Captain Barrow. So he did go down with his ship. Um, he was an elderly captain at that point. He was, I think, 81 years old. Um, some of the survivors, um, at least one who was in the water for 25 hours, actually did make it to Panama City. Um, he was picked up by a motorist who was actually driving by, and he went into town and told everybody that the ship had sunk. And so the Coast Guard dispatched plane and vessels to go out to the site to look for survivors. Um, there were some who survived, of course, um, but and many of them had been in the water for about 30 hours before anybody got out to get them. So pretty interesting story here and an unfortunate unfortunate wrecking event the tarpon shipwreck um let's see let's go forward here here is a site plan of the tarpon shipwreck um and it's kind of a spread outside i don't know if we have anyone in here who's actually dove on tarpon um she's a fairly deep shipwreck um, uh, deeper than most of these other shipwrecks. Again, she was almost 10 miles offshore. Um, so she's in about 95 feet of water. So this would be uh, an advanced open water certification dive for all my divers in the top. Um, but an interesting uh, site to visit nonetheless. You can see um, the machinery for the twin um, props, twin screws, and you can see a lot of the, um, the outer works of the vessel as well. So the gunnels and the general shape of the ship is pretty apparent when you dive the site. Um, you can also, there's a, 
their plaque is on the site. I know sometimes it comes and goes, is uncovered, um, but it is located on the site, should be located on the site. Uh, let's see, we got moving forward here. Um, the site plan in my picture here, that was of course produced by the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research um, when they were nominating the vessel to become part of Florida's underwater archaeological preserve. And I see that someone posted the website for museumsinthesea.com. Yes, that is indeed the website where a lot of this information is located. Um, here are some divers on the site. Um, and you can see some of the, um, I think you can see some of the machinery and hull components in this photo here. Um, the tarpon became a part of the underwater archaeological preserve um, in 1997, so a few years after Massachusetts as Florida's sixth preserve. Um, so not a lot of great photos that I have, unfortunately, of tarpon. Um, like a lot of shipwrecks here in Northwest Florida, um, the visibility can be beautiful or it can be very terrible when you dive these sites. And if it happens to be a bad day when you're out taking photos, um, then you, you're kind of out of luck, unfortunately. And so that's the story of the tarpon. If you go to the Museums in the Sea website, there is a lot more information and photos on there. So I highly recommend visiting. The last shipwreck I'm going to talk about is the Baymar. And so again, moving further east, um, Baymar was sunk off of Port St. Joe, which is a lovely place to go and visit if you've never been there. Um, but here is a artist's rendition of Baymar. This was created for the Florida Museums in the Sea brochure that accompanies it. Um, but Baymar, and this is a picture of her, she was actually built in 1919 as a British gunboat, and her name was Kilmernock. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but she was a, um, a patrol gunboat, essentially for the British Admiralty. When she was built, she was 170 feet long. She had a 30-foot beam or width and a 16-foot hold. So she was a fairly deep hold vessel. Um, she was, um, could carry a lot of cargo with 16 feet. Um, she was a steel-constructed uh, vessel with steam engines, triple, triple expansion steam engines. Um, in 1920, or in the 1920s, I don't think we know the exact year, in the 1920s, she was sold to a private firm and renamed Chelsea. And this is where her story gets really interesting. I think of all three, maybe Weimar is my favorite. Um, she was confiscated by the US government, so she made her way over to the US at one point, um, and was confiscated for smuggling liquor during Prohibition. So this would be sometime in the 1920s during Prohibition. Um, and then in 1928, I think a lot of you have probably heard of this individual. Um, Rear Admiral Richard Byrd purchased her um, from the US government to support his very first expedition to Antarctica. So Admiral Byrd is a very famous explorer, especially of the Antarctic region uh, for the United States. And he was looking for two vessels that would help that um, expedition. He already had one primary expedition ship, which was called the City of New York. Um, but he was looking specifically for a vessel that could hold a plane. And what his plan was to do was to disassemble a plane, reassemble it when he got to Antarctica, and then do an aerial flyover of the South Pole. So that was kind of his mission. So he purchased uh, Weimar, what we know now as Weimar, or she was Chelsea when he purchased her. He purchased her specifically because she had a very large cargo hold. The city of New York, his other vessel, could not hold a plane, but Chelsea could. So he bought her for $34,000 uh, from the US government. Um, the other thing that was admirable about Chelsea at the time was that he was cheap. <laughs> and she was a cheap vessel. So expeditions cost a lot of money. Um, so he packed Chelsea. He renamed her um, Eleanor Bowling, actually, in after his mother, um, Eleanor Bowling Bird. Um, the vessel underwent a lot of repair, actually almost double what he paid um, for her, um, in order to get ready for the Antarctic expedition. Um, one of the most important things, of course, was reinforcing the bow of the vessel so that it could cut through Antarctic ice as it made the expedition. Um, and she was actually uh, one of the first metal-hulled vessels to go to the Antarctic waters. Um, so kind of another, another cool thing about Chelsea or Eleanor Bowling at this point. Um, the ship was very sturdy. She had a big hold. The problem was is that she wasn't entirely stable. 
um, she didn't do very well in the rough waters around Antarctica. And for that reason, <laughs> the people who were sailing or working on the ship renamed her um, Evermore Rowling, right? Eleanor Bowling, Evermore Rowling, for the way that she would cut through the water. Uh, she wasn't a whole lot of fun to be on during this expedition. Um, so she did her mission. Um, she was the first metal hulled vessel there in the Antarctic, and she actually made several voyages between Antarctica and New, New Zealand um, before the expedition was completed in 1930. Um, eventually, she was sold to an Arctic sealing company for about $15,000 because she was no longer seaworthy for his second Antarctic expedition. Um, and you can see in this photo here, this is a picture of what we now call Weimar or Eleanor Bowling. Uh, they're cutting through the Antarctic ice after she was reinforced for Admiral Byrd's mission. So kind of a great photograph there. Here's a picture of her rolling around in the Antarctic, uh, in the waters around Antarctica. Um, not a fun ride. So after Byrd's expedition, she was eventually purchased by the Weimar Shipping Company in 1933 and renamed, of all things, Weimar. At this point in time, and this actually, these are great photographs here. This was her condition on the top of what she looked like when she was purchased by the Weimar Shipping Company. I'm not sure I would have ventured out very far from land in that vessel. Um, and then, of course, you see a photo on the left after she was refitted. Um, so she was used as a tramp steamer, and this was kind of an interesting um, kind of cargo vessel. Tramp steamers would essentially travel around from port to port, getting whatever cargo they could get, whether it was um, rice or timber or uh, fruit. Uh, guano was a really big export in some ports, coal. Um, they would go to ports across the world, get what they could, and then take it and sell it, get whatever cargo they could in that port, take it somewhere else and sell it wherever they could go. So that's why they call them tramp steamers, because they are essentially like tramps. They went all around the world doing whatever they could. Um, so in her career as a tramp steamer for the Baymar Shipping Company, she eventually found her way to the Florida coast, the Northwest Florida coast. And in 1942, um, she entered Port St. Joe uh, with a crew of 18 people to take on a load of lumber Northwest Florida, very big in lumber exports, and to go to Cuba. The crew on this tramp steamer um, was very diverse, right? We know from records that there were um, Yugoslavian crew members, there were Cuban crew members, there were Spanish crew members, um, crew members from all over the world. And that was kind of the nature of these tramp steamers. They picked people up and then people left as they were tired of working. Um, so very diverse crew, many different languages being spoken. Um, so she was coming to Port St. Joe in 1942 to get that load of lumber. Um, as all of these stories end, once she took on that load of lumber, a storm came through. Um, there were records saying that the water was relatively calm at the time. Um, I think, as we'll see in a second, there were some dissension with that. But anyways, for whatever reason, the ship was very heavily laden. The seas picked up and the ship sank. Um, now, it's important when we talk about uh, Weimar and kind of what happened after she sunk uh, that we remember the time period in which she sank. And so this is our World War II connection here. 1942, the United States was in the midst of World War II. There was a lot of fear of German U-boats um, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, of German boats um, wrecking or obstructing major rivers and thoroughfares and ports in the United States. This was a big problem for people and they were very concerned about it. Everyone was told to be on alert. And indeed there were minesweepers going up and down the coast of the Gulf of Mexico at this point. Um, so it was a concern. When a ship with a very diverse crew sank, the Baymar, sank off of Port St. Joe in 1942, there was a lot of talk in town, right? The story from the crew was that the ship took on too much lumber. It shifted in transport while they were leaving the channel, going out from Port St. Joe. Um, and she just listed to port too much and sank, right? The problem was is that it was blocking the channel. And for that, the reason that the crew was diverse and the reason that she sank in the channel was very problematic for people. Um, and so there was a lot of suspicion in the town about the conduct of the crew, uh, their diverse nature, 
and the, the the mysterious circumstances was there a storm was the the wind strong were the waves strong uh, when the ship sank and there was a major coast guard investigation into the sinking mostly because the town had had really wanted them to initiate an investigation on this crew um it was determined by the Coast Guard, and they actually did send down divers on this wreck, which actually is not very deep. It's under 30 feet. Um, the Coast Guard divers went down. They saw no, no evidence to substantiate the suspicions of the, of the town that this was a, a saboteur trying to block Port St. Joe. Um, honestly, at the time, Port St. Joe was kind of falling out of favor in regard to Apalachicola as a major port. So if if the Germans were indeed trying to sabotage shipping in the Gulf of Mexico, they probably would not have chosen Port St. Joe as the port to sabotage. Um, but that was the rumor. Um, so the, after the Coast Guard investigation essentially cleared the crew of any wrongdoing, um, and the, the real reason why Weimar sank has never been determined, but we most likely think that it was due to overloading of timber on the ship, right? They were in this for money, so you're going to try and take as much cargo as you can and possibly the cargo shifted and the ship sank as a result of maybe some turbulence in the water. Um, but if you go to Port, or Port St. Joe today, you probably will still hear some stories among locals about um, the sabotage and the World War II connections with Weimar. Um, so here, actually, I don't have a site plan for this one, but I do have this cool photo mosaic. So this is a compilation of photos of Weimar. Um, so you can see her stern, off to the left and then her bow. There's a, actually a good bit of structure exposed on Weimar. Now I haven't been back to Weimar since Hurricane Michael. Um, I actually dove it about one month before Hurricane Michael came through and I'm really curious about the condition of the site afterwards. I've been told that there's still a good bit exposed but I'm sure it's different than what it looked like a month before. Um, but it's an excellent dive. It's a fairly shallow site. Um, again, Northwest Florida can be a great dive, could be a very murky dive. Um, but an exciting dive nonetheless, and plenty of structure to see. Um, so here's just some photos. You can see some of the, the outer components or the, the side, the hull, the outer hull of the ship um, there. There's an archeologist documenting it there. Um, the Weimar became Florida's ninth underwater archeological preserve in 2004, um, nominated by the local community, of course. Um, oh, yeah. And I think, I think that probably wraps up my story for Weimar and the presentation. I'm trying to keep this under an hour for everybody just because I know everyone has time constraints. If anyone has any questions, now's a really good time to go ahead and type them in that chat box and I'll try and get through them um, as much as I can. Um, I'll just go ahead and conclude by saying um, we are doing these Zoom into archaeology presentations again because of social distancing requirements and the fact that the university has mandated that we are not doing public events right now. So this has kind of been our answer to be able to do our jobs without going physically into the community. Um, we plan on doing more of these Zoom into Archaeology presentations um, throughout July. We've had one every Thursday in the month of June and I actually have done two additional ones of these earlier today. So if some of these um, some few folks may have joined me for those. I see some pretty uh, familiar names from earlier. So we have another one next week, next Thursday at 3.30 Central Time. Um, and that is by public archaeologist Tristan Herrenstein, who works over in Tallahassee. I mean, he's actually kind of talking about a silly but interesting topic on, on feces and what human feces found archaeologically can actually tell us about the past. So that'll be a really fun and interesting one to listen to. Um, we have not yet released the schedule for July talks, but we'll be doing that soon. Um, so if you want to know when those talks are coming up and how you can learn more about Florida archaeology, be sure to follow us on Facebook at FPAN Northwest um, and go to our website, fpan.us. You can click on the Northwest Region tab. You can sign up for our newsletter and that way you'll get all of this information about our upcoming events and talks delivered right into your inbox. And of course, we have a YouTube channel, which we've really been vamping up recently because of our working from home status. Um, so there are a lot of good videos on our YouTube channel now about archaeology. So let me go ahead and I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll go ahead and start answering some questions here. Um, 
All right, so question about the Emanuel Point shipwrecks from earlier. Um, did an oyster bed grow over all or part of the Emanuel Point shipwreck? That's a really good question. What we see when we dive on the Emanuel Point shipwreck today without having done any um, excavation is essentially a sandy sediment bottom, right? There's a lot of outflow from our nearby rivers, the Escambia, the Blackwater, the Yellow River. Um, and we can actually see some of the ballast stones sticking out a little bit above the sand. Now, when we actually excavate that site, when we create a unit and start excavating with induction dredges, we can see a lot of oyster shell. And so our suspicion is, is that when the ships sank, um, they did become populated by oysters. Um, and we find a ton of oyster shell. It's actually very bad for the, the long-term maintenance of your, your wetsuits and your rash guards. Um, so yes, there is a ton of oyster capping the Emanuel Point shipwrecks, but it's old oyster. It's not recent stuff. Over time, the sediment outflow from those rivers totally covered up the site and it's mostly anaerobic right now. So that's a really good question. Um, let's see. Massachusetts versus Ariscany, I answered that question earlier. Massachusetts was intentionally sunk, but not as an artificial reef. So she has kind of a historic sinking with historic significance. The Ariscany, um, which is the aircraft carrier, sunk about 26 miles south of Pensacola Pass, um, also has historic character, um, but it was sunk in the modern era as an artificial reef. So just kind of a slight difference in those two. Um, let's see, Jean asked about the site plan drawings. I believe the site plan drawings for Massachusetts are also on the website. I can pull it up real quick and just double check. Um, if you go to the Museums in the Sea website, you can click on the, I believe the underwater guide tab on the left does have kind of the site plan on there. Um, if you're interested in those drawings, Jean, go ahead and send me an email and I can send you those photos or the drawings. Um, how do museums in the sea keep sites free of predatory slash dangerous animals? Um, I think maybe what you're referring to there are sharks um, or other kind of more dangerous sea life. Um, they don't keep them free of those things. Um, you know, that's kind of the gamble when you dive is that those things will come around. A lot of these museums in the sea sites, or some of them at least serve as fishing spots and spear fishing spots. And so I guess as a diver, you have to kind of weigh um, the risk of what's going on at the site when you decide to go dive it. If you're concerned about spear fishing and the attraction of sharks, then maybe go dive another site and then come back to this one uh, that you want to dive. Um, so there's no real way of keeping sites free of those things, but um, you know, we leave it up to divers to make those calls for themselves, obviously. Um, a question about university asking, um, actively searching for shipwrecks. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Now, actively meaning before COVID-19, yes, I guess. I'll put a caveat in there. The University of West Florida is not running their field schools right now. Um, and we're actually have not been doing face-to-face -face instruction at all in spring or summer. And this is normally when we do our underwater field schools. Um, but Apart from that kind of anomaly in our, in our schedule, yes, we are actively looking for shipwrecks. And we've actually, I mentioned the manual point shipwrecks from 1559 earlier on. Uh, those are part of the Tristan de Luna fleet of shipwrecks. We know from historical records that seven of the ships in that fleet sank. So far we have found three of them. So presumably there are four more out there. And because those shipwrecks are so old, um, they're of uh, some pretty big importance for Florida history. And so, yes, there are active attempts to find those other shipwrecks. The problem, of course, being that the shipwrecks that we know of were covered up and likely the other ones are as well. So it's a matter of using remote sensing tools like magnetometers, um, mostly or sub bottom profilers to find those sites. Um, a lot of people ask if we can use side scan sonar to find the other lunar wrecks. And the answer is no, not really. Sonar looks for things on the surface of the water. Um, and if something is buried under that surface, then we can't find it with sonar. So mostly magnetometer is how we found the other two wrecks. Um, those giant anchors and other metal components, iron components mostly, really stand out on the magnetometer. And that's how those other ships were found. 
Um, as far as other other shipwrecks, yes, they're popping up all of the time. I mean, they've been there for a while, so they don't just pop up. But we do find new ones all the time as we do target diving investigations or storms come through and divers in the area report things to us. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes. We actively look for and search for sites. The great thing about being a university is we have a lot of students, right? And I was in this position once. Um, we have a lot of students to help us do that. So we have a lot of, of um, hands. The state of Florida, they have five underwater archeologists for the entire state of Florida. So they often do not get out um, as much as universities do to do research on these sites. Um, let's see, someone asked if I've had a chance to dive on the 1559 wrecks in Pensacola. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, the shipwrecks, they did indeed wreck in 1559. Um, that is where almost all students at the University of West Florida cut their teeth as they're learning to do underwater archaeology. And yes, we do actively still dive, and I have dove many, 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 many times on those shipwreck sites. They're fascinating. Although I will say, very dark, murky water in Pensacola Bay. It's very rare that you actually get to see those sites that you're excavating. Often we're working um, essentially with, with no eyesight underwater. <laughs> it can be very challenging. Um, other wreck dives near the coast that I recommend for new divers. Uh, that's a good question. I guess it, it kind of depends on what you're comfortable with. A lot of these historic shipwrecks are in deeper water. Uh, Massachusetts is a great dive for new divers. Um, you just have to be sure to dive it at a, a high tide and preferably a king high tide um, because the water rushes in and out of Pensacola Pass between tides. So you really, it has to be a very calm day to go out there. But if you can dive Massachusetts, I highly recommend it. Another one that's not historic shipwreck, and I don't know if you're located in Pensacola or not, um, the Paddy Reef Barge was something that was sunk here in Pensacola relatively recently by uh, the Joe Paddy um, companies. So that I believe is 30-ish feet. Um, that's another good dive for beginners who want to start doing some wreck dives. Once you get into 60 and 80 feet, those are really some of my favorite shipwrecks to dive. Um, so those of you who, who can and want to do an advanced open water certification, I highly encourage it because that's when you get on some truly amazing sites in Pensacola, including um, the San Pablo, which is on the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail. And I'll type in that address, Shipwreck Trail. Um, this is another site of historic shipwrecks, some historic, some artificial reefs, but really cool stuff nonetheless. Let me go ahead and pop that into our chat box here. There we go. Um, let's see. Are GPS locations available for all the sites discussed? Yes. Yes, they are indeed. So if you go to the Museums in the Sea website and you click on whichever shipwreck you're interested in diving, you will find the coordinates in there. Um, typically they are on the, if you click on the brochure um, area, you'll see a PDF. Um, it says USS Massachusetts brochure. That's where the coordinates are located if you're interested in those. Um, let's see. The Spanish wrecks in Pensacola, yes, they happened because of a hurricane. Um, yes, and therefore St. Augustine became the oldest continuous European settlement. That is 100% true. Pensacola actually was settled prior to St. Augustine, um, but uh, the settlement did not last. The hurricane wiped out the ships, and since most of the supplies were still being kept on the ship, the settlement did not last much longer than that. It was abandoned by 1561. So yes, St. Augustine gets the title for oldest continuously occupied European settlement here in the U.S. Um, someone mentioned one of the Luna ships ran aground and was destroyed. Yes, that's absolutely true. There were 11 ships in the fleet. Three of them actually made it out of Pensacola before the storm. They were communicating back and forth with Mexico and Cuba. One of the, there were, that means that there were eight ships here when the hurricane rolled through. One of them did indeed get thrown onto shore, according to historic records, leaving seven ships that got sunk that we know of in the water. So we found three of them, um, four potentially left. Um, are we looking for specific artifacts? Um, not really. Um, that's kind of an interesting question. As archaeologists, when we're doing archaeology, we don't just go and dig up a site because we found it or because it's cool. 
usually we have a research question. We operate a lot like a hard science. We pose a hypothesis. And a lot of time that will be, you know, it could be anything from what were the food ways of Spanish colonists coming to Pensacola in the 1600s, right? And for something like that, we would look specifically for artifacts related to food ways, right? And a good place to start would be the area where you think a galley might be on a ship. Um, another question could be what are, you know, the, what, what was the construction forms of, you know, fishing schooners in Pensacola in the last half of the 19th century, right? There were indeed fishing schooners here. So, you know, in that case, we would be looking for specific areas of a ship so that we could get the information we want to get. Um, so yes, we kind of do look for specific artifacts, but it's always framed in terms of a research question. Um, so I hope that, hope that answers your question there. Um, thank you all. I see some good comments there. Thank you all so much. Um, someone asked why the university no longer marks the Emanuel Point Rex with a barge. Um, that's a really good question. There is still a barge. We actually retired the old research barge. I think, I think it was last year or the year, no. It was a couple years ago, two years ago, um, because uh, Patty Shipbuilding actually donated a brand new research platform to the University of West Florida. And we actually did launch that for our summer field school, um, and we'd been using it for a couple of years. We pulled it in because of, I think, one of the tropical storms, or it might have been Hurricane Michael that moved through. And because we have not continued dive operations this year, we haven't put the... Um, the research platform back out. So that's why you don't see it out there. It's not because it doesn't exist. We have a, actually have a brand new, very fancy one. Um, it will go back out once we start resuming our research operations. And I guess that will be whenever the university allows us to do that um, as best as we can dealing with COVID-19, unfortunately. Um, have I dove the Catherine shipwreck? That's a good question. I actually gave a presentation earlier today about Catherine. Um, and yes, the answer is yes. The Catherine is a really cool dive, very shallow, has an amazing history in its own right. Um, and it recently has been really uncovered. Um, so it, I think for a long time when I first moved here, the shipwreck was mostly covered up by sand. It's right off of Santa Rosa Island. So it's a very dynamic site. Um, so yes, I have dove it. Um, it's one of those hit or miss kinds of dives, um, which, is, which makes it interesting, I think. Um, the Vasa, good question about the Vasa. I have not had the chance to see the Vasa, um, which is in, in the Vasa Museum in Sweden now. And I'm very jealous of all of my friends who've gotten to go see it. I was actually supposed to be in Helsinki, uh, Finland for a conference in underwater archeology span this year. And I was gonna make a trip over to see the Vasa as kind of a side thing. And it, obviously it got canceled this year. So didn't get to do that. I did uh, last year get to go see the Mary Rose, which is uh, the flagship of King Henry VIII um, over in England. That's another very large wooden shipwreck that they raised from the bottom and have tried to preserve. Um, pretty amazing stuff. Check out the Mary Rose Museum online if you get a chance to. They do some really cool online engagement stuff as well. Um, but yes, Vasa, someday I'll get there. Well, I think that's it for questions that I can see. Um, my email address is on here. I'm gonna type it in now. Feel free to shoot me an email if you have any specific questions. Jean, email me about those um, drawings. And I hope everyone considers joining us for another talk in the future. Again, fpan.us. Visit our website. You'll see other talks that we do in the future. We had a lot of interest in underwater archaeology, so I'll make sure to include at least one underwater archaeology um, presentation next month. Um, and I'll switch it up a little bit. Maybe I'll do an entire presentation on those Emanuel Point shipwrecks. Um, so hopefully I'll see some of you there for that one. Uh, thank you all again, and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon.